I think a lot of people don't realize how few people really owned most of the slaves. It was really an oligarchy of the day. It really was. Uh, uh, I don't have the statistics in front of me, but it would really kind of shock you as to how many people actually really owned most of the slaves. That is uh, an aggressive, aggressive oligarchy. Yeah, yes. And, you know, we all know that if you live, you know, when you and when a war starts, you go wherever your buddies are going. If you're a young person, right, you just go where the gang goes. But, yeah, you're right. Sandy, what do you think? Do you have any thoughts? I know you have thoughts, but it's... <laughs> when you were talking about a small number of slave owners, were you referring to Jefferson County or to the country as a whole? I was referring to... No, wait. Okay. You're, you're talking to Bill now, right? Yeah. The country, the country as a whole is what I'm referring to. Jefferson County was sort of a mix. What it was was not at all an industrial strength slave system. And uh, the southern part of the county, I think the, nobody had more than the 69 slave persons that the Dandridges did. They, they had some with 20 and 30, but then all, all of the, the overwhelming majority were small farms with two to five or no slaves, okay? That's, that's the most dominant thing here. I like to say that we're not as bad as the Deep South. They were bad. No, for, no they really, really were harmful to people. So, uh, oh, I'm so glad you're back. <laughs> Um, because I, I've been talking, you know, you saw my email, at least I've been quietly listening and talking to historically oriented persons who are black or whatever, who are colored here, you know, Jim Tolbert, George Rutherford, everybody knows coach Taylor, the Taylors of the renowned Taylors of Charlestown, they're, they're legendary. And it takes a long time for them to trust you to tell you things, and they did. So, on here, I'm talking about the two at the top. The one on, on the end is the bower. And you see the image on the end here, this is what I was talking about, the community, the nighttime, uh, nighttime uh, dancing and singing around the fire. This is Bertha Fox Jones, incredible woman. She died just a few years ago. She, she's the one, she's the one that, and two other women that basically ordered Jim Tolbert to start the NAACP. Now this is John Fox, and this is Benjamin Fox. I'll tell you this story and this story. Once again, when you take a person as a source, you sense of, who they are, right? Reputationally and all of that. Bertha Fox worked for the IRS. Um, this is the story. The story came down from John Fox. Okay, we'll frame it up like, right. It's 1855, it's at the Bower. The owner is Adam Stephen Dandridge II. And he's now controlling all kinds of farms, uh, including one over in Carneysville, where John Fox often is. But he's running everything, 69 people enslaved. The, the Fox family has this story. It came from John Fox. And after the war, John Fox started, uh, I love it, Bertha Fox called him a, a lumberjacket. <laughs> lumberjacket, she meant lumberjack. He worked in timber in Carneysville. He told his family how during, before the war, or this little anecdote, Underground Railroad. It took me years to figure this out, but he was at the farm in Carneysville when, and I think I told you already, but when the train came through to get water and stopped, he get 
people to jump on and he covers cover cover them in straw. So he's part of that escape pattern. But after the war, what kind of man is this? He starts just doing lumber and he keeps working and working for Dr. Daniel Border. He's an incredible worker and he's very Christian. You know, the, the church was started in Carnesville by him. That's his lumber, the Baptist church. Then he has another, you know where the, uh, the fruit station is? Uh, I mean, the uh, uh, Wiltshire Road, the agricultural place. That was his farm. He owned like three, four farms. Fox Glen was his. And the reason it's a mess is, let's be honest about it, Charlie Marcus and everybody developed it, didn't do anything they were supposed to do in the plat, just, just ruined it. This is true. And the, state, and the county didn't know how to enforce anything. That's why it's what it is. But he was, when he died, when he died, there was a newspaper obituary about it, and even the Dandridges praised him. They said, they said, this man's moral beauty reached throughout the county. He's just a good man, you know? So now we know who our source is, okay? He told this story, and he told it to who Bertha Fox called Uncle Dewey. Uncle Dewey, I love it. He was 101 or 102 and gave a lecture, a talk down at the Summit Point, one of the, one of the churches down there about 20 years ago. Well, here's what he told her. She said, he told me everything because I like to listen. You know, it's always, so, most of them don't give a damn, but he recognized the one that was interested. And let's say he could be wrong, okay? He might be wrong. But here's what he said. John Fox told me that there was five of them, John, Benjamin, Stephen, Mary, and Humphrey. And Humphrey was sort of a, uh, was the, was the uh, worked at a bank in, in Martinsburg. He was the janitor. They had a mother who they only knew her name was Mary. And here's the, here's the heavy part, but now you understand the sources of the people, the quality of John Fox. Uh, all we know, as Bertha said, was her name was Mary. And the last time they saw her, oh, Bertha Fox said, they started finding out that the men who were, the people who were being sent from Africa were getting sick and they were dying on the, and they didn't make, make the passage. So they started having, having babies here. Well, it appears that, she, that Mary Fox, who had five children on the sly, they were Betsy Dennis, another who, the others always listed not Mary Fox as their mother in, in a marriage certificate. They said Betsy Dennis. Betsy Dennis is a relative who also works at the Bower. She was in charge of the children. And you kind of sort of part, start putting it, by the way, I was working with Charles Fox on this. You kind of get the idea that Betsy was just kind of hiding these kids with her, all the kids. That's my assumption. But the last time we saw, they saw Mary, according to John Fox, oh, Mary, okay. She refused. She was told to be a brood woman, according to Bertha, and she refused. Now, what, I love the way Bertha Fox said this. Now, you don't go telling your own what you're not gonna do. That's how she put it. You don't tell them what you're not gonna do. And she said the last thing they saw was Mary tied up on the back of a small wagon with a single horse, and they was beating her. So, you know, it's terrible. And if you're me, she never came back. Five kids, the only conclusion we know she died in some form. Because a mother with five kids is going to find move heaven and earth to get back to her kids. We don't know how she died. Of course, Bertha assumed she was killed, but that's all we know. I, I'm not going to press your credibility on this, but Charles Fox is a very creative person. You know, he's a teacher and all that, and he he was he meditates a lot and all that. I don't. I'm not going to say I, I buy this, but he said. He's written, he's been very close to me on this project. 
he said, I was meditating. He was thinking about this. And he said, please, you don't have to accept this at all. But she, he said to me, he said, Mary, oh, Mary came to me. This is after years of working on this. And she said, she killed herself. She killed herself. She, and I'm guessing drown, drowning, if it's even true. And she said, and the only other thing he got out of this meditation was that Dandridge just wanted to control her. And it could be, could be complete nonsense, but I'm just telling you. Okay. Well, the neat thing is, you think this, this is, she confounded every expectation I had. She said, well, after this happened, an old black guy went to the main house and said to the mistress of the house, which is Catherine, the cousin of John Pendleton, he said, ma'am, there's some foxes. There's some foxes back in the house. <laughs> She didn't know, she thought, oh, there's little foxes, you know? Great, let's go get them, you know? Well, anyway, they went and there's five little kids, little, you know, little ones running around, the foxes. Benjamin, John. And the story goes, they brought this news back to, the, to Dandridge, A.S. Dandridge, and he said, bring them in to the main house. That's very interesting. It does imply some kind of closeness. And that's it. But the neat, and then, and then the story was given from John Fox that they were little and they had, they had, don't be all shocked at everything. I was all shocked. Where the milk was, they were sharing the bowl with, with, with the dogs, the cats and dogs. That's what they did. You can see, Kath, you can see some, I, I'm not going to judge that. But you know what? I was ready to do what we all do. Oh, Bertha. You know what she looked, she looked at me, she says, no. Because they were in the main house, they learned how to read. <laughs> it just blew my mind. She said, don't you get it? They all learned how to read and write. And the, that was just, you know, the price of it. And sure enough, they all did well. The whole Bauer story sums up with, a wonderful moment where I think it's Benjamin Fox and one of the Dandridges, who I think was a bishop, it, one of the Dandridges was an Episcopal bishop. And there are Johns Hopkins at a board meeting. I guess it's an ecumenical meeting of, and all the men of religious men are there. <laughs> and Dandridge, you're a Dandridge? Are you a Fox? Fox Dandridge? Let's go see the Bower. And they both came back here and went visited the Bower together. It's a very, very uh, profound, interesting story. So we'll leave it at that. You can draw any, any conclusions you want. I, I'm just telling you what I've got. We doing all right? Okay, anybody who's lived here more than two minutes knows that Coach Taylor is extremely well regarded for a million reasons. The Taylor family, uh, is their dad, Doug Taylor, changed my life. There's not many people. I had an hour long interview with his dad. And sometimes there's people who are just uh, unforgettable. You know, when there's a great preacher and their words are not separate from their whole being, you know, their whole character and the words are they're all the same. And, and, and I'll never forget him. He said, he says, the only, he's got this gravelly, I have a video of it. 1991, he died two years later. He said he had all, he had eight kids. Jim was one of them. He says, the only two things worth dying for are, this, are the King James Bible and the Constitution. And he's that kind of guy. The only things worth dying for are the King James Bible and the Constitution. But it was the little things they did to hurt you. It's the little tiny things they did to break you. You walk down the street and you see some girls, black girls coming the other way, you better just turn around and go home. You, or, or if you're in a house and there's a, a, a lady at the top of the stairs, you just back around and go down because you do not know what could happen. That's what it was like before 1960 and 50. That's what he said. He was born in 1912. And I never understood this. We didn't, there was not a single, what I call, vigilante lynching in Jefferson County. Be proud of that. 
There never has been. I've looked real hard. One came close. And he was he was taken to uh, Moundsville and tried. He was tried and taken to Moundsville and hanged. Nineteen three. Berkeley had two. One was an absolute tragedy. Um, you know, we had a family in Jeff Shepherdstown named the Tollivers. Matt, Matt and Hattie Tolliver. They had owned a whole building. This guy was a Tolliver. You know the woman Robin Roberts who's always done. The, she's she's related. And that one. What you should be proud of is Berkeley, Berkeley and Jefferson County were got outraged. The newspapers were outraged and their souls were searched when these things, when the Tolliver thing happened. You know, he's a good man. And, and the image simply for you is they pulled him out of the jail. It's like 1890. And picture yourself going for a nice meal at the, at the, the, red, the red barn, the barn were on Berkeley. Berkeley Plaza Theater, the barn restaurant, you know, where the Berkeley Plaza. Yeah. Look at that little road where it that you turn to go in there. And here's Route 11. Just go follow that over to Route 11 to the trees. He's on a wagon there, you know, ready with the thing here. He's well dressed. He's a gentleman. You know, and he prays. He gives a prayer, you know, and all these. Ah! And he says, he says, farewell, gentlemen. <laughs> Unbelievable. A gentleman to the end. <laughs> farewell, gentlemen. But everybody, everybody learned that's wrong. That's what we can be proud of here. Now, Jim, sometimes I call him, I call him George Rutherford, <laughs> Jim Tolbert, and birth is a lioness. I call Bertha a lioness, but those three men are my lions. Gentle. But here's what Jim said. It took years for him to tell me this. Two things. He said, we didn't go help at the John Brown raid because we assumed he was a black man. Another Nat Turner, which of course, of course you would assume that. And you're not going to come within a country mile of that. And that's, that's what he told me. He has his sentence here. Did you know, they didn't go help, but this is what this is showing you. This here, those little colored dots on here, and this one, see? Those are all the suspicious fires in, in, on all the farms on Jefferson County in just the period in, in about a month or six weeks after the John Brown raid, suspicious fires. Now, you have to understand that you couldn't get, you are so much security, you could, no outsider could ever get into the county. I mean, Henry Wise was stopped in, in, in questions when he tried to get into the state county. So those are, those are probably set fires. And they also don't tell, remember, they didn't help, they didn't help John Brown that much, really, they didn't. But the next image here I have, when it came around the next year and they did the census, they asked how many people you have are enslaved. But what this is showing, you all have it, it has a, a whole column of E's. It's this one. These are all E, E, escaped, 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 escaped. 589 out of about 3,000, 3,500. That's called really taking off. So there, it's, it's not true that they're all happy here and didn't give a damn or anything. They just had their own methods. Okay, but Jim, you know, I figured that out myself and Jean Libby, a professor at, at Berkeley pointed that out to me. I'd sure like to know why the park service isn't talking about this. They should have that. When Jim told me one of the most sensitive things he said, my great, great grandfather, William Payne. Now, and I checked, I double checked. I'm gonna do a little Sherlock Holmes with you. It's this, it's this image. It's this image. You can see I have a lot of documentation all over it. Jim says, and you remember, he does his research. He's a high school teacher. Dave knows him. He said, my great, great grandfather, William Payne was a breeder. What? He was a breeder. 
and uh, he was in Hall Town, and he worked. He worked for it was he worked for a landowner, and he did it about no. Trust me, I, my jaw was dropping. I was totally ready not to believe any of this. Okay, come on, man, you know. But he said he was a breeder, and he said the the owner said, uh, "Remember, this is money." And he said uh, he did it twenty three times, and I guess for that one, he was like a. He was what you call the Northeast distributor. <laughs> Sorry. And then he said the last woman that this happened with, and he apparently got along in a funny way with the owner. And stay with me here. We'll figure out who he was. Um, he said, I'm going to set you free. If you wish to marry the last woman that you inseminated, you may. Her name was Rachel Parrish. Of course, that does not work out. <laughs> and you'll find her in the census. He remarried again to a woman named Nichols. I don't know how many grades that is, but that's, that's a, I think, his grandmother or great grand. That's Jim Taylor's grandmother, great grandmother. Okay, now this is what happened before. I wanted to be right before I brought this up. If you know the count, and by the way, even today, there's a little tiny piece of land on the map called Payne's Hill. I forgot to show you. He set him free, said you can marry her, and he gave him a piece of land. So you understand, let's be Sherlock Holmes. That's Payne's Hill Cemetery, right next to Shep Shipley, Shipley School. And, that, and Jim said that's our family cemetery. There's about 10 people buried there. And of course you go, aha. What larger parcel of land was that within before the Civil War? And was a large landowner. It points it out. He, that landowner gave that land to Billy and Payne. It was, it was his. There's only one really large landowner in, around Halltown, and that is Ryan Hall and William Lucas here. So you can, you, you can see my little Sherlock Holmes at work here. I'm going. There has to be evidence of Lucas giving land to Payne, you know, and then it was. Can you imagine how I felt? You see this little tiny parcel that says Lucas, and it's where Payne's Hill is. That's a, that's a researcher's pleasure. You see what I'm saying? It's small. It's an outlier piece of land if you look at the map. It's not really a part of his big farm is where Payne Hill is. So, you know, I, I felt comfortable enough to tell you. But I, I love the detective work. I have to find a piece of land that was Lucas's, that was where Payne Hill was, and it's so. Anyway, I'll take any questions for you. We're all done for today. How are we doing? Did I tell you anything? I, was, I mean, a friend of mine said, don't bring that up. It was, it was documented enough. And you look at the sources, like John Fox and Jim, Jim Taylor. We still have a really good county, by the way. Don't forget, we did not want us to see. We wanted a peaceful solution. But when there's a war, remember the ones that 447 people from Jefferson County marched to, to Boston to join George. Did you get any advice on how to behave at the dinner table with George Washington? <laughs> they never end. Don't be angry at the dinner table, even if you're furious. So there were, I said there were three waves of German immigration. But it strikes me there was more. You're, so, you're just, yeah, you could. So I missed something. Here's the basic. I missed something, and the time frame's important because yeah. 17. 1707 is the first, but there had to be more before that in order for there to be a documented. Correct. So then it's the second and the third, but it strikes you, me there was a fourth. But so you ask really proper questions. I, I was trying to kind of hustle it out and not explain everything. But what I do know is that I didn't understand before. The Palatines are just so persecuted by the French soldiers. This is, these are Germans. Right, I hope they'll call them palatines, but they all go to 
Rotterdam and to England. Everyone goes to England thinking they will find work. England had work to do in upstate New York getting bark for tanning. That was what they all heard. So Haidt and others that came this very, very early, all, I guess it's still in the 1600s, they go up to England and then one group is recruited by Grafenried in Switzerland. And we think we heard there's gold in Virginia near Germana. That's really, really early. But I did not realize till now till recently that the Palatines of London were the, were the ones they recruited. Some of those came all joined that expedition. You see, that's, that's why I understood why out of that early, early bunch, it was a disaster because Grafton Reed tried to take Indians as slaves, which sounds like the stupidest thing to try to do. So he was even imprisoned by the Indians and many were killed. So in that disaster, the, the, the healthy ones just migrated north. And that's much, much we knew. So here we are, uh, Michelle, who was one that was with him, gets to Harpers Ferry and draws the drawing and there's a report. And now we have the angles, <coughs> probably for a couple, maybe a good 20 years before that. No, no, Katarina was born in Germany. But the long and short is, you're right, we have, Evidence, or evidence then of that map in the, in the angle story that the only place it could have come from was, was that earlier from the South. And then what happened, what happened to people who went to upstate New York, that was height. It was a bus, it was poorly ordered. It just wasn't, you know, it, it was not worth it. And they just, just, they disbanded and moved away. And a lot of them came down here. So I, maybe there's, I can't explain the variety of Anabaptists and Mennonites. That's the problem. Number three is all murky, lots of little religious fragment groups. Mm -hmm. So I, 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 I finessed your question. Two and a half. I think we're done. Do you want to, anybody want to add? Thank you, Sandy. Yeah. Thank you, Bill. One thing, Jim, one thing I wanted to say, weren't there um, a large group of Germans who followed um, William Penn to Pennsylvania and then migrated? From the air. Hey, John, number three. I believe you, and I didn't know that. I believe you. And what happened is when they went far enough, they realized if you go west of the Alleghenies, it's Shawnee. And that's probably, yeah, they already learned that. You're right. So, so they migrate, yeah. Thank you, Sandy. That's number three, the William Penn people. Okay, thanks again. <laughs>